Now that we have our small breadboards together, we can experiment with what a circuit is. And that's really the point of this video. We'll just play around a little bit with some of the components we have and just try to put together circuits or really just paths for their electrons and positive charge to flow. And remember, they both happen simultaneously, opposite directions, of course. But that's the point of the video is just experimenting. We'll get into you know, more component theory and learning our multimeter and being able to take measurements and do calculations on the simple circuits that we'll probably just show you now. But I think it's a better plan to just show you the circuits first to really help you see how you put them together and um, what it looks like on the breadboard, etc. And then we'll then we'll do some future videos for all the all the calculations and measurements. Most of these parts you can find in your little divider jewelry box here. Um, so what you're going to pull out of there is the, the two lamps. Uh, these are two push buttons. These are two slide switches. This is another push button. I'm we'll backfill with the theory. The resistors, um, they're going to be in your box here. Okay, so you got to find the 10 ohm resistors. They're going to be in some of the earlier slots because that's, you know, fairly low resistance. And you'll know they're 10 ohms by the color code again, which we'll cover in more detail later. But if you find ones that have a, a brown, black, black stripe, and it finishes with a gold stripe, that means a 5% tolerance. But it turns out that um, brown represents the number one, and then black represents the number zero. So we have a, a brown, black, black. And, it, and the first two are digits, and then the third one is a multiplier. So you have one, zero, and then add zero more decimal places. Or in other words, multiply it by 10 to the zero power, which is just one. So it's uh, 10 ohms is what that is. So one, zero, and then zero more decimal places added. So these are 10 ohm resistors, brown, black, black, and a gold stripe. The jumpers that we'll use are, are the higher quality ones. If you remember, they're like the little square sort of plastic terminations um, that came in a bag like this. <clears throat> and you want to get the ones out that have the pins on both ends. So far, what we have on our breadboard are two voltage sources that are creating imbalances by way of a chemical reaction internally. And the imbalance of charge is, you know, here and here, right? This is where electrons are being stripped away from the positive side of the battery and pushed to the negative side and likewise over here. So you have this imbalance that wants to equalize. And we've brought that onto the breadboard on this rail and this rail for this battery and likewise over here for this battery. So what you wind up having is an imbalance known as voltage in this case, since it's an imbalance of charge that has a pressure to equalize um, that exists then between the red and the blue. And of course, we had said before, you could give it a free path and don't do this, <laughs> your battery will heat up. But I mean, I could just put a wire as of my path. And if I do that, the charge will be happy to be equalize rapidly. You'll get a high current uh, the battery will get hot as it tries to maintain the imbalance with its chemical reaction. So that would be a dead short. It would be a path. It's not a path we normally use. Well, instead, maybe grab one of these little lamps. <clears throat> now this lamp is going to provide a path, but it has some resistance because of that tiny little filament inside. It's just a th very thin wire that makes it difficult for, your, for current. And so hence there's resistance. And what we'll get from that is collisions and so forth um, as the charge flows through that lamp and it'll generate uh, heat and light as the, as, the, as the current flows through that small metal filament. And you can check it out. We have one and a half volts available. Um, I think these are three volt lamps. Probably the best way to try it is on that diagonal that we mentioned before. The pins will go in like this. You, you can see that they'd have to bend towards the middle a little bit. So try to find the easiest way to insert. But there you go. And this is a nice way to test out your, your work that we had done previously 
to put the batteries on. And you can see it glowing. And that is showing us that current is flowing and it should. You've provided a path. You had voltage, you gave it a path. There's a current that flows. And later, of course, we'll measure that current quite easily with our meters. Okay, so that's good. And you can also prove out the other rail. And actually, before I do that, let's just show you, of course, it doesn't matter where you put that lamp, right? Anywhere along these rails is just fine. Right? And that's good to understand that these rails are all the same point. The red rail, anywhere along the red rail is the same point electrically. So it's important to get comfortable with that concept. Um, it's not the, it's not sort of like a, a, like a physical layout or something you would deal with as an architect or a mechanical engineer. Those are different points. You know, what I'm talking about is, you know, that's a different spot than that. And that's a different spot. But electrically, no, that's all the same point in a circuit. You can check out the other battery too, of course. And so this is a good way to very simply prove out your construction so far on your board that the batteries are working. And of course we can use our meter and we will use our meter. Maybe in the next video we'll go ahead and get our voltmeter involved, show you how to measure the voltage again and um, the current and the resistance of all the components and we'll do calculations with Ohm's law, etc., and power. Of course, this is a very simple circuit, but I, I wanna draw it for you, the schematic version of it, and um, then we'll talk about uh, some things about how they don't maybe look exactly the same, but they are the same. So let me draw that for you. So here I have the simple circuit built and there's a path from the positive terminal through the lamp and then return path to the other side of the battery. So the, the flow is gonna be like this. Here I have it drawn. Here's my voltage source. That's a universal symbol for voltage source. My lamp, uh, the little squiggle is just the filament, represents the filament and it circles the glass enclosure. And you can see it's a complete circuit. And a circuit is simply a path, a complete path for the, that uh, facilitates the flow of charge. As our circuits get more complex, they might not match up completely. In other words, the schematic drawing, which is what this is, using schematic symbols, it might have a slightly different layout. The goal is to always lay out the schematic as best for the schematic, as far as neatness goes and easy to read it. And then when you come to the physical layout, the rule is again, whatever is the neatest and most accommodating for the physical parts. So. They don't have to be a literal representation of each other, but they do have to be an electrical representation of each other. Here I've changed the physical layout of the circuit, but I haven't changed the circuit itself. The schematic is exactly as it was, and it is a true representation of here. And this is just a simple example of, of, of that. Um, I've taken the lamp and I've moved it down to two nodes and I've brought the positive side of the voltage source to maybe the left side of the lamp and then the right side of the lamp that node I've brought to return to the to the negative side of the battery so here the flow would be sort of the positive charge conventional current is what we're using and then through the lamp and then back and then back along this rail and to the battery so the schematic of course just shows clockwise flow and that's typical and that's all you need. I mean, you want a simplest possible representation of the electrical truth. And then the literal physical layout, sure, it's going to go, you know, maybe down, over, up, over, down, but you're not going to draw that in your schematic. Uh, it's not the way to do it. But it's the same circuit. And I wanted to just prove that point, even with such a simple circuit. Just a reminder, when you're putting a component on a node, Remember what we had said way back when we talked about breadboards. Um, each pin here, the lamp, you can see has its own node, I think. Um, I mean, here's where I'm putting it between these two nodes. Classic mistake. Don't do it. Uh, you know, you put the component and you just put both leads of the component on the same node and you just short out the component. So don't do this. Don't put the lamp where both leads are on the same node. Something like that would be a bad idea. 
And then if you tried to connect to it and you know you forgot that all five of these are all connected with the same piece of metal, you would create a dead short. And your batteries would get very hot, or at least this battery would. Maybe a good idea, if you're brand new to all this, you can monitor whether you've created a short accidentally. You know, just keep checking the temperature of your batteries. If they're getting hot, pull the wires out. <laughs> We said this is the generic symbol for a voltage source, it is. And you can also though use a specific symbol which represents a single cell of a battery. And we will use that actually when we're playing around with these two AA batteries. So we will use sometimes this um, voltage symbol. It's a, it's a symbol that represents a voltage source and specifically a single cell. Now these AA batteries are each a single cell. So we only need one of those, but that'll help us when we start combining the batteries, we'll use this schematic symbol to represent one battery, and then we'll use it again to represent the other battery. So here I put in the symbol for the single cell voltage source, which in our case represents one of the batteries. And maybe we can try something now. Uh, we can uh, add a second battery, perhaps. For our first experiment, let's consider the fact that the lamp is Know, pretty dim. So if we want to improve that, we can um, try to get more current to flow through it. And we can get more current to flow. Well, we can't really change the path that much. We're stuck with this lamp. But we can add a second battery. And if we do it correctly, we can double the voltage. Now, it's important how you add the second battery. So if you think of them as um, maybe two trains pushing, you got to get both engines pushing the same direction. I mean, schematically, I've done it here where I've got two batteries now, but it, but it, notice that they're both pushing, we could say, or their pressure uh, in the same direction. So conventional current is um, really in this direction for both batteries. So <clears throat> their efforts will combine and we'll get twice the voltage, we'll get twice the push, twice the pressure if we do it properly, if we connect them in series, it's called. And in fact, we can add one more description. This would be not just series, but um, we've combined these batteries in the schematic as series aiding. In other words, they assist each other, they aid each other. You can put them so that they butt heads, so that one battery is pushing the opposite direction. And you can, I think, see what would happen. You would have the net voltage of zero, if assuming both batteries are equal. Same thing with the train engines. If they're pushing opposite each other, you're going nowhere. They're both pushing with the same force or the same pressure, but the net pressure is zero. So here we have what's known as series aiding. This should double the voltage. And if you think back to some of our earlier lectures, you know, where you had that difference in water level and we kind of established this whole idea of flow between two um, different amounts of anything. So you have an imbalance. And remember, if we doubled it, we also just figured just, you know, intuitively the flow should double. And we got Ohm's law to really summarize all of that. So we don't have to keep drawing that picture, right? So Ohm's law tells us, you know, that given a certain voltage and a path with a certain resistance, you'll get a certain current. And of course, double the voltage, you'll double the current. That's assuming the resistance stays consistent. So we're gonna oversimplify a little bit with the lamp the truth is, as we get better and better at being the technician, we'll see more and more details. The truth is, when you double the voltage, you will increase the current. And in the case of a filament lamp, the resistance actually goes up a little bit too, because the filament burns hotter and, as, and metal has a positive temperature coefficient. So as it gets hotter, its resistance goes up. So I say all that to tell you that the absolute truth is the in the case of a filament lamp, current won't exactly double. 
We'll get into all that later. I mean, that's the true technician view, though, when you get your meter out then and you see what's really happening in the circuit. There's lots of details to uncover, even with a battery and a lamp. And we'll definitely uncover those because we'll make the point that uh, that's what turns us into technicians, to really know the details of what's going on. I mean, yes, this, uh, this video is all about just creating a path, you know, applying a voltage source with an imbalance to a path and seeing things happen and creating those paths on a breadboard and getting oriented with schematics and schematic symbols. That's plenty for this video. But in upcoming videos, we'll get a little more into the details and we'll see things like the actual lamp current measured by the meter and calculate things like hot resistance of the lamp for a given current. We'll even look at things later on in oscilloscope that show even more detail because I can tell you when I turn that lamp on initially, the current spikes because the filament's cold and the resistance is low for cold metal. So you have this surge current and then the filament heats up and it tapers off in a nonlinear fashion. And then you settle down to this steady state current. Um, so lots of details, but they all can be mimicked in a tiny scenario like a lamp and a battery. And they all take place in the, in the big industrial world in the same way. So all the concepts we learn will have these miniature models, but the exact same thing happens if it's a titanium furnace, you know, melting titanium, you know, and you have all these different resistances and these inrush currents and so on. So all these things, even though at a miniature scale, we learn them and we model them, they're, they are the fundamentals and they come into play um, in big ways. So let's try to make this happen in a general sense. Um, again, we'll, we'll, we'll overlook the little details and we'll basically say that we're going to basically, we are going to double the voltage. That's true. And we won't quite double the current, but we'll get back to that. Why? But let's just make that lamp kind of sort of twice as bright, kind of sort of twice the current. Um, from a hobbyist viewpoint, we would probably just leave it at that. We'd say, yes, it'll be twice as bright and it'll be twice the current. And then from a technician, we explained, right? Not quite the truth, but let's have a crack at it. We can look at our schematic and it's important to see that. Maybe I would say, I would recommend when we do these little exercises to draw it first and then try to follow your drawing and build. That's most of the time, that's the way it's going to happen. Sometimes you have to reverse engineer something. So it is true that you can sometimes have to look at a circuit and make a drawing from the circuit. But nine times out of 10, it's going to be the other way. So let's look at our drawing. We care and, and let's make sure it makes sense, right? But it, we did that already. So that's part of it. When you do something, when you try to create a circuit, create it with pencil and paper, take a step back, look at it and say, am I right? Does this make sense? And I can see both batteries are pushing in the same direction and I can see there's a path through the lamp. So I like it. Now let's look at exactly what those connections are. I can see one side of the lamp is connected to the positive of one of the batteries and that's still there. I don't have to change that. However, the other side of the lamp is connected to the negative side of the other battery. So I'm going to change that. So I'm going to move that down to here. <clears throat> now, I'm not done yet. Do you see this connection here? The positive of this battery which is down here, the positive of, of that battery, if, if this is battery two, I'm saying this battery is this battery. So the positive is connected to the negative of the other battery right here. So I'm going to just put a jumper. The positive of the bot of the, of the, this battery, which is this is connected up here to the negative of this battery, which is here. So let me put a jumper in there. And just putting this jumper in is exactly what puts these batteries in series aiding because I'm taking the positive of the one battery and connecting it to the negative of the other. They are now in series aiding. You can see coming up. Yep. All right. <clears throat> and let's see why my lamp isn't lit, right? Probably a Got to figure out what connection isn't there for me. No, might be a battery holder thing. Let's see what that is. You can see I'm not giving up on it because I know I have it built right. This is tricky for you when you're starting. You're like, oh no. 
And I said these are reliable in quality, but let's check them out. When I wiggle it, is it the lamp itself maybe? Okay, so that's a good indicator. That's a, maybe not a bad <laughs> thing to have happened. Um, now we got the lamp lit. You know, I had to I had to sort of wiggle this wire. I think it was maybe the lamp itself, um, the the pins and the and the breadboard where they really making connections. So sometimes if you uh, kind of you know polish them up a little bit, if there was a little too much oxide, maybe that was it. I always want to try to repeat it if I can, make it make it go out again. But somehow <clears throat> I can't. I can't get it to be out again, but I'm guessing it was just maybe some oxide. <clears throat> I'd say that's a key to, to breadboarding is confident that you had a good drawing first, then confident that you wired it right, and then figure out what wire isn't cooperating for you. Looks twice as bright, kind of. You know, we can use that as a rough, rough estimate. And we did it by putting two batteries in series aiding. Here I've removed the circuit, but I've kept the batteries in series aiding. You can see, because it did just take one wire and I wanted to just emphasize that this part is still intact. I've just taken away the path, right? So there is no lamp connected, but the batteries are ready to go. And I've tried to stay organized. That's another point to make, I think, because I've jumpered maybe across the middle. That's a habit I like to do with this small breadboard. And what I have then is three volts from the outside positive rail to the outside negative rail, there's three volts. And we'll do, we'll check that with our meter. I mean, if you want to even check it now, why not? Let's do it. We've done voltage measurements, right? Let me grab the meter and we'll bring that in. Just can't resist having a quick look at voltage. So we've got our voltmeter now because it's our it's our digital multimeter, but we've taken the selector switch and put it right to volts DC. So it's ready to go, ready to measure voltage. Keep an eye on the engineering notation here. It's millivolts at the moment, but this thing will auto scale. That's the, what the auto means, and it's DC for DC volts. And remember, it measures the voltage at the red lead with reference to the black lead. So um, let's check that. Why not? We can check that we've got what we think we have there. I'm checking the battery on the left and it shows me 1.586 volts. That sounds right for a AA battery. I can check the battery on the right. You know, I'm using the, the test leads that are banana jacks to go insert right here and then the pins. Uh, looks like at 1.597, that looks right. And of course we, we just did the series aiding thing. So let's check it out. There's our doubled voltage, 3.184. So volt, voltage is easy enough to measure. So we'll do more measurements, current, resistance, hot resistance, calculations, and so on. If we want to, while we have our voltmeter on the scene, we could put those batteries in series and um, maybe put them in opposition to each other and see how close we get to zero volts. It, they won't be perfectly matched, but just to show you um, that that is in fact what happens. So let's think about this. How can we do this? We would have the positive butting heads with the positive side. And then let's try this. Here, I've redrawn the schematic for you. So this is what we're doing. We're just gonna try to get the batteries to push in opposite directions. And you can see the, the positive of each battery is connected together. And then the net voltage is out here on the outside. So let's just see how that worked out. I mean, each battery still is pushing with approximately one and a half volts, right? That's still happening. But if I look at this series opposed wiring, I'm going to look at the outside, which is the negative sides of each battery, right? That's that's the outside, the net push. And you can see, don't forget to see them, take note of the millivolts. It's about 10 millivolts of net push. So they're, they're not perfectly balanced, the two, but um, essentially zero volts net voltage. 
Now I've reset the circuit back to our original series 8 in configuration. You can see the jumper right in the middle. So I've got my three volts on the outside again. And that's the configuration now that we'll use and we'll play around with some other types of paths and circuits. Um, we don't have much use for the series opposed right now, but that will come up again. The actual um, voltages that are sometimes need to be overcome as they sit in opposition. So that'll be a thing. And another thing, I mean, if maybe you're thinking in the back of your mind, yes, there is another configuration that we didn't talk about, and we will bring this up later too. And that would be what's known as parallel. So yes, you can put the two batteries in parallel configuration. And that would be just taking the positive side of both batteries and connecting it, and the negative side of both batteries and connecting it. And there would be a parallel configuration, and you don't increase the voltage by doing that. You still have the same voltage you had before. In other words, the difference in voltage between these two points doesn't change. You still have your one and a half volts. And that begs the question, so what did you gain? I mean, you paid another dollar to get a second battery. It didn't help you out by increasing the voltage at all. But there is a point to this. There is something to be gained by putting the batteries in parallel. Maybe you know the answer, but we'll answer that. It's kind of a, a longer answer. <laughs> has to do with current capacity and current capability. Both of them are improved. Um, it has more current capability. It doesn't mean more current will flow. Ohm's law determines how much current flows based on the voltage and the resistance you connect. So it doesn't force more current, but it has more current available. So that would be sort of the, the capability for any moment before you would exhaust the ability of the chemical reaction inside. So it has more current capability. It has more current capacity, which means the batteries will last longer because you have more capacity to draw from over time. So the benefits are capability and capacity. We'll get into that. I don't want to do examples of that now. I mean, we have enough on our plate just learning what circuits are, but I thought it might be bugging you that we talked about series aiding, series opposed, and then the elephant in the room for some of you might have been, what about parallel? And there it is. So, okay. So we won't deal on that. We'll dive into that on another video. Let's have some fun now. We, we have, I think, the basics of what a circuit is what our little breadboard has there for us. And um, so let's play around with some of the other components. I've restored the circuit back to the original, uh, not the total original, I've restored it back to the circuit we just had previously where we had the two batteries now providing three volts for a single lamp. So two batteries, one lamp. Here's the lamp, right? It's getting the three volts because it's on the outside rails. Um, and I've got the series aiding here. But here it is, flowed conventional flow through the lamp from one side of the lamp to the other and down. Okay. So three volts in one lamp. To get here, remember we doubled the voltage and essentially doubled the brightness of the lamp, kind of sort of doubled the current, not really from a technician. We'll figure that out later exactly what those values are. Incidentally, if they were fixed resistors, Ohm's law would hold true. It's just the fact of this hot filament changing temperature with current, that's what throws a wrinkle into our, our otherwise simple Ohm's law. So we'll do, we can do some demonstrations with just resistors and we don't have to keep throwing that caveat in. But um, we doubled the voltage. We got a brighter lamp out of that. The other lamp's probably feeling lonely at this point. It hasn't been used. Let's get it in the mix. And to do that, we can just add it in series. I mean, yes, we could add it in parallel too, um, but Let's just put the second lamp for now <clears throat> right in series. How are we going to do it? Well, pick a node, pick, pick two nodes, I guess, right? And maybe, you know, just for neatness, I'm going to line it right up right below the other lamp. Sometimes it's easy and a good idea to do that because, I mean, I could put it somewhere else, but like if I put it over here, you know, for example, that's fine. I could build it, but you see how later when you're doing measurements, keeping track of which lamp is which, you know, is this lamp this, or, you know, so on. When you're writing things down, 
uh, I think it's obvious, but I, I think it's, it's worth mentioning because I, I, I see this, I see people do this and that just making life hard for yourself. So when it's possible to make it a closer representation of the, of the schematic and the, and the physical layout, do it. Why not? So <clears throat> in the schematic, the, the upper lamp and the lower lamp, I can mimic that. I have that luxury. I'm going to do it. So I'm going to put them in series. So I'm going to, you can see one side, one side of this lamp is connected to the positive, but the other side is connected to the other lamp. And then the other side of this second lamp is the return path back to the negative. So let's do that. I got to get the right node. You'll hear me say a lot of times, you know, off by a node that happens. <clears throat> so you have to just be able to see where you're at. But, um, and it looks like we're right back to where we started, right? I mean, we had one battery and one lamp. Then we doubled the batteries, doubled the voltage, and we got the brighter lamp. Then we doubled the resistance of the circuit, essentially, kind of, sort of, again, because of the filaments of the lamp. But, um, and we're right back to where we started. And that is that same thing. We, we talked about that earlier. You know, if you have a certain voltage and a certain resistance, you get a certain current. You double that, this doubles. If you double both, you're back to the original. That's what we just did. Two batteries and two lamps. You know, we could go back to one battery and keep the two lamps. And we'll get something like half the current. Again, the hot resistance to the lamp is going to mess with that a little bit. But it'll, it'll sort of prove a point. So let's see. Let's do it. Let's keep the two lamps in series, but let's go off of just one battery instead of two batteries. So sometimes if you think, oh man, how am I gonna change this up? I mean, just maybe you, you could pull all the wires if you want to and then just redo it. Um, sometimes that's easier <laughs> than trying to figure out which wire to change. I mean, here I've got my two lamps in series. I'm confident about that. And now I'm just gonna use the battery on the left. So I'm gonna bring the positive to the, to the one side of the one lamp, right? I'm gonna, I'm going to be doing away with this battery is what I'm doing. Okay. So I only need the one battery and I want to see what happens. And I'm certain what will happen. Uh, I've got two lamps now. So the resistance has increased and I'm down, but I'm down to one battery and they should be very dim. <laughs> In fact, you might not even be able to see it. There might not even be enough current to get that filament glowing. I think I can see the one just very faint, but maybe <clears throat> it's pretty tough. So you might not have proof that current's even flowing with your lamp. I can see a tiny, tiny glow. Maybe cover, get it dark and you can maybe see it. No big deal. Uh, when we learn how to measure current with our meter, we would absolutely be able to just put the current, put the meter into the path and monitor the current that's flowing but it's um it's much less of course it is um because we left the resistance that's more or less doubled while we while we didn't double the voltage kept that the same if you're wondering if you built the circuit right of course we could put this jumper back in that 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 gives us the series aiding we're still only using the one battery because of where we connected our circuit, we connected it just to the top battery. A simple test of my wiring would maybe be just, if you can't see the lamps glowing, move this down to the, th the three volt and there they are. So I feel confident that I have good wiring, but when I just pick off half of the voltage source, I'm here. Yeah. So. so that's a nice way to prove out the relationships of voltage, resistance and current otherwise known as Ohm's law with our little breadboard and just two batteries, two lamps. You can, you can just kind of prove a lot of those concepts. I see the video is getting long. So what I want to do is wrap this video up and, and we'll call this one part one, and then we'll do part two where we get into some of the other components that we had laid out in the beginning. Um, to finish this one off though, while we have the two batteries, two lamps sort of thing going on, let's just review quickly. I mean, we had the one battery and one lamp and that was dim. And then we said, uh, let's get that thing brighter. So we put two batteries in series aiding and uh, notice what I'm doing here. I'm just taking the, the three volts through the single lamp. And that's how we got that lamp to burn bright. And then we said, you know, let's bring the other lamp into the mix. So we brought it in 
And of course, we were back to where we started when we put it in series because we had doubled the voltage, but now we made the path essentially twice as difficult again. And um, we're back to just two dim lamps. What if we wanted two bright lamps? Can you think of a way? There is a way. And that way is instead of having the path's resistance increase like this, um, we can give both lamps the full three volts. And that would be by putting them in parallel. So uh, let's just do that. Want, see how that lamp is getting the full three volts because the difference in voltage from this point to this point is three. Black wire is kind of in my way, isn't it? <clears throat> and all you do is just put another lamp right in the same, two, right across the same two points. That's what parallel is. Things are in parallel if they share the same two points. So those lamps are in parallel and Let's see what happens if we do that. Let's try to even figure out how we do that, right? So again, if, if, if it might be a little easier just to pull wires and then put new ones in as opposed to which wire do I change? So you can do that. I mean, you can pull some out and just reconfigure. So this sometimes makes it easier. Uh, let's get one lamp going, right? Full bright. So how did we do that? Well, we took the three volts right to that one lamp, right? So on either side of the lamp, we've got three volts. Okay. And so I essentially, I mean, I built this part of the circuit. Now I still got to get this other lamp in the mix and I can see that I just need to bring that lamp to share right where the other lamp is. So I'm going to put it in parallel easily enough. I just need to get the node that that one's sitting on. I mean, I can jumper wires over. Do you think there's room on the board to get both lamps on there? I don't know. Uh, it's a little tight. So I'll stick with my original just jumper jumper over. So I'm going to just take the, the one side of the lamp to share the same point that that lamp shares. And I'm almost there, right? I just need to get the other side of that lamp to share the same point. Oops. There we go. So let's see, I can see my, my lamp, my one lamp, the pins are a little bit, have to wiggle them sometimes. Here we're getting into that spaghetti world, right? So um, just so you're aware, this works to prove a point. It's a little harder to see sometimes. Now I've kind of spread it out a little bit to help myself see it, but you know, if you wanted to have this as a little demonstration that was a little easier for someone to follow, you would use maybe pre-cut jumpers or cut your own that are color coded and you could really make it obvious, I think, that, 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 that the, what's going on on the build matches the schematic. You can make it a little easier. And again, I mean, here the lamps go top to bottom. I mean, here they go left to right. And that's fine. That's that's the way it's going to be. The physical layout doesn't follow the same layout as the schematic necessarily. We've got both lamps burning bright now. Um, they both have access to the three volts. And um, I don't know, maybe, maybe you might be asking yourself the question, so why wouldn't I always do that? Why would I put them in series? when I can get them both burning just in parallel, what's the trade-off? What, what, what would be the downside? Um, I should always, it seems like free energy maybe to you. I don't know, does it? Uh, but there is a trade-off. When I went and put them in series, they were burning half bright, as opposed to in parallel, they're both burning full bright, but what's the but? What's the, what's the cost? by putting them in parallel. Can you think of it? The cost is, if you think about it, although I have two lamps burning full bright now, which seems great, um, they're only gonna last half as long. Those batteries, I'm gonna drain them faster. So the parallel lamp thing, sure. If you need two lamps burning bright, great. It just will last only half as long as the other circuit where they were both burning half bright. So there's no such thing as free energy. Um, there's always trade-offs.
times the trade-off in this case. So we'll end this video here. We'll just call this one part one. It'll just be the two batteries, two lamps. And hopefully you got a good understanding of maybe how to lay things out. You got an understanding, I hope, of what a circuit is. It is just a path. And you can see I, I stripped it back to the two batteries in series, which are gonna both push with a net voltage of three volts. And we, can, we would maybe notate that that way, something like that, perhaps. And um, conventional current then is going to just flow through the path that we provide. And the path that we provided was with some wires. I mean, here's a wire, here's a wire, here's a wire, and a lamp. But as long as it's a complete path, right, you get a chance for circuit to, uh, for current to flow. And it sure looks complete, right, because the lamp is lit, which does indicate the current's flowing through the lamp. So as long as you have a complete circuit, a complete path, current will flow. And this is that. In the part two video, then we'll start introducing other elements which, you know, allow you to interrupt the path or, in other words, turn the lamp on and off. I mean, you can stop current from flowing very simply, just open up the circuit, right? So opening up the circuit is very easy. If you have a little break, current can no longer flow, right? Current will stop. And then there's the components that do that. We'll look at those in part two, um, and we'll introduce those schematic symbols, but a simple little switch, you know, that you, that you maybe turn on and off. I mean, there there is your, your room light right there. Only the difference is it's 120 volts here, and then a switch on the wall, and then your lamp for your, your light for your room. Um, well, little, a little push button, perhaps, you know, you push that button down and you can turn the lamp on, but when you let go, it pops back up. So things like that we'll introduce in video number two, part two is coming up. Actually, I can make a switch preview just out of these two wires, right? Just, um, don't connect it, right? I broke the circuit open and the light goes out. Big surprise, right? Here and here's what a switch looks like. These two, it, a switch is just two pieces of metal. Let's see if I can get here. Two pieces of metal that come together. If they come together, the lamp's on. And if they're apart, the circuit's open. So here they're closed. Two pieces of metal touching each other is a closed circuit and the lamp is on the circuits the current's flowing now it can't flow there's an open <clears throat> that's all switching is just connecting to push button or slide switch toggle switch whatever and again we'll always add more to it as technicians that gap if it's too close Maybe there's a spark that could jump if the voltage is high and that causes trouble. So arcing and things like that come into play. If there's too much current, the two pieces of metal that come together could weld together. They get hot and stick together. Now they won't come apart. So you can have contacts that you know, are well-intentioned to just be opening and closing, opening and closing. But when they open, a spark jumps and closes it. Or when they're closed, they get welded together and they won't open. So all those things are good technician things to learn about simple switching. But we'll get into all that stuff. Got to introduce the stuff first. There's your switch. That's all it is. So you can try that with two wires and convince yourself what's going on there. And then we'll do part two.